the earth. And um, I have family members that have been involved in that a long time. But the Word of God has a lot to say about needing a joint. You may not know it, but it does. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. When you find it, would you stand? Or in other words, are you comfortable? Ephesians 4, if you haven't found it, it'll be on the overhead to help you out. I said, I don't know. I don't like really the smell of it, but how about a gummy? Oh, so you'll say, Pastor, why are you always going to Colorado? It's my grandkids. <laughs> Come on, get your mind right. Get your mind right. I did. Ephesians chapter 4. What's funny about this is Sister Lori's been a little bit sick this week. As a matter of fact, real sick. And so this message bounces back and forth. And as soon as it got to Cheryl, uh, she's been sending Lori a message. You need to join. And I, that's a, you, need, you need to quit. Leave it alone. Amen. But I want you to remember this. I, I taught milk last, uh, I mean, Wednesday night to the youth because I, I, I wasn't so concerned about them remembering me. I wanted them to remember that the Scripture teaches that we start off with the milk of the Word. And we got to grow in milk in order is the mercy that saves you and the intimacy of getting alone. And when God wants to do something in your life, he isolates you. Amen. And then we talked about how powerful love is. And then kindness, which brings forth koinonia, which I talked about last week, choice fellowship. I wanted them to remember that one word, amen, to help them as they walk and grow in God. And today, you need a joint. And we'll tell you real quick. Why? Ephesians 4.11 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. This is known as the fivefold ministry that Christ himself gave me to you. That's what he did. You know, when you sit and you look at a pastor, you think, well, you know, we got a pastor. No, you need to understand. Christ gave me to you. You as I and I as you, okay? We're connected like that. So he talks about apostles, the ones that have the gift and ability to open and close. One that has a, 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 I've often used the thought of a portal that between heaven and earth, when the apostle shows up, God opens up the heavens. Now, this is not to make any man or woman arrogant, but it's for them to understand that when they go to a place, God will open it up wherever they're at. When I first came to Channel View, Texas, Ronnie, there was a, um, there was nothing happening, right, sir? Not a lot happening. And God exploded a youth group there up to over 100 kids in just a little while. And then I went to Crosby, Texas, and there wasn't a lot happening in this town. Amen. As a matter of fact, Kenny, nothing was really happening in this town. We started at a motel and moved to an auction barn and built a large church here in the city, and the city exploded. I went to New Caney, and when I got to New Caney in 2003, there was a four-lane there, Jerome. It was when you were skinny. Amen. It was a long time ago, and, uh, uh, and when I think about when I got there, there wasn't a whole lot going on, and then it exploded. Now, I can't tell you that I'm the reason this happened. But I'm suspicious that wherever the apostle goes, things open up. Things start happening. So the apostle has that ability. Then there's the, the prophet, the, the one that can point a word and give you a word, an appointed word. And sometimes they share about your future, which is so important. Then there's the evangelist, the longest reaching finger. The evangelist is, is traveling out. They're, they're out from the building. We'll have evangelists in this church within the next few weeks. Amen. But they, they're reaching people. They have an ability to win souls. Amen. Our daughter right now is doing the work of a missionary evangelist. She's, in, uh, she's heading to Turkey next, you know. So there's that reaching out. Those are our missionaries that do things. And the pastor is the, the married finger. He's married to you. Amen. He's there to teach. He's not, he's not the most popular. I mean, no, marriage is not always the most popular person after you've been with them a while. You get to know their quirks, their mess-ups, you know, all their little, you know, this is what hits me about, about uh, traveling. When I was an evangelist, I would blow in, blow up, and blow out. Boy, everybody loved me. I'd just blow in, church would fire up, I'd get them excited, then I'd leave. Man, they couldn't, they'd say, man, would you come and pastor us? The issue there is so simple. You don't want the guy that came in here, blew up, blew in, and blowed out to pastor you. Amen. Because they only have five sermons. And they're really good with them. 
Amen. They don't even need their Bible. They can just blow up because they do it in every church. That's the evangelist. But as a pastor, you, you get to, you know, I get to know you, you get to know me. And if you, if you can handle that, we can stay together a long time. This 20 years now, right? So that's, that's a good thing. And then the teacher, I always say, is the one that can clean out your ear to help you understand. So the issue is, he said, I gave these five so everybody that teaches the Word of God, Christ gave them to us. The pastors he gave, the evangelists he gave, the prophets he gave, the, the uh, apostles he gave to the body of Christ, okay? And he did it for a reason, to build up the body. All right, and then watch this. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and the blow and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. In other words, now we're getting established and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become uh, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The uh, King James says it this way in verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself together. A joint is a point where two bones meet in the body. A joint. It's a place where two things or parts are joined. It's also considered a particular place, shared, held, or made by two or more people, parties, organizations. Together, a joint could be a, joint could be a bar. A lot of folk have been in bars, and they call them joints. And then if it has music, it's a juke joint. Amen. Uh, it can be a senior citizen meeting house, a joint. It can also be a church. Amen. Where people are joined together. Father, thank you for the word. Anoint my lips to share it. Our hearts and ears to grab hold of it. Give us this day our daily bread. Let this be bread for the people, Lord, to grow with. In Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The synonyms of a, of a joint is common, shared, communal. When we have communion, it's the joining together. It's the joint. It's the fasting, the twine, the uniting, remaining. And it supplies. The joint just doesn't hang out. It supplies to the house. It's a contribution to furnish beside to fully supply. One of the things we've learned out at the ranch is we're always needing couplings or joints to put pipe together. We'll have a, a water leak. Uh, Renee say, Pastor, of the water bills through the roof. We got to find it. So we go running around the property to try to find where the leak is. And sometimes in the church world, I think we got a leak here. Amen. We got, we got a leak. We got a break in the pipe. Somebody's not, uh, not, not being supplied or, or supplying. So we got to put the joint back together. So what's it going to take? A little labor. <laughs> Sound like Somebody was getting chased. <laughs> Lord, don't let them get too stupid and wreck in Jesus' name. Amen. First Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I beseech you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we all speak the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's his buddy. And there be no divisions among you but that ye may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul goes on to say to the church of Corinth, I got a problem with you because there's divisions among you. So he said, you need to learn to speak the same thing. Uh, I'm, I've been a blessed man for 30 years of pastoring. I've seen very little divisions in the churches I've pastored. And one of the things is we've learned to speak the same thing, and we've understood it's the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. We serve one another, look after one another. But when I'm reading this, he, he wanted no divisions. He wanted to be perfectly joined together. That perfectly means to be repaired and adjusted. I mean, you know there's times in the body of Christ you've got to adjust yourself to get along. You got to adjust the way your actions and what you do so that we connect and we're able to do things together. That's what he's saying here. That's perfectly. There's all types of joints. And I, I'm speaking among some men and women in here that really understand this word. But there's double jointed. I was fascinated by a young lady in the high school that I went to. She was double jointed. She could take her thumb and shove it all the way back to her wrist. Shocked me. I tried. 
couldn't do it, but that double joint has something to it. It means people that with more than normal flexibility in their joints are considered to have hypermobility. I have seen it, and many of you have on little videos, where somebody's able to bend their back all the way back to the ground and their feet still be on the ground and their head touching the ground. Now, I watch these little kids do that around here when they're young, but how many know when you get a little older that that doesn't happen for all of us? But to have that kind of flexibility like a gymnast and, and to have a gift that way, which means their joints, their surrounding structures and ligaments and tendons are able to bend further than normal or more accurately further than average. Usually genetically means meaning it runs in the family. If, you know, when a parent has it, then the kids can do it. And I'll say this about double-jointed people. They have the ability to connect with people. Amen. They stretch a little bit further. Some of us, and I'll just be honest with you, you're too stiff in the joints. You don't reach. You don't connect. You don't, you don't reach out. And the Scripture teaches us to be friendly. And if you're friends, if you got friends, it's because you were friendly. Amen. And friends are so important in life because you never know when maybe your son is stuck in northeast Tennessee. Amen. You got to have friends out there that you got to make friends and connect with people. So double jointed means I'm able to stretch a little bit further. I'm able to do a little bit more. I, I'm not. Uh, some folk, man, they, they really do need a little persuasion. I don't mean to be mean to you, but you, you, you got to start making more friends. And then there's that out of joint. You ever had something out of joint where, where you get a shoulder hit or something, and all of a sudden it pops out of joint, your knee gets out of joint. Boy, I've been there several times, out of joint, out of place, dislocated. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. But when the, the head of a bone slips from its socket, it's not working well together, and you got to have a little surgery. You know what I'm talking about, Marie Bush? Amen. A little something got to take place to make it work again. Hallelujah. Uh, and then there's universal joints. It's a joint or a coupling in a rigid rod that allows the part to bend in any direction and is commonly used to transmit a rotary motion. Let me tell you about universal joints. They go out of their, their way to connect. In other words, when I say universal, they don't get upset that you are not their race, you're not their culture, you weren't raised on the east or the west side of, of Crosby or Channel View. Amen, you're universal. I, I can reach anybody I can. Amen. That's, that's why I ride a Harley. I want to reach the bikers. That's why I got a hot rod. I don't want to reach the gearheads. Uh, I, don't, uh, I have cowboy friends. I let them reach the cowboys because I ain't got no horse no more. Amen. That, that was, was short-lived for me for a little while. And it's smart. It was smart. The last time I was thrown off a horse, seven and a half, almost eight years ago, and it was uh, 150, 200 yards away from the nearest person, and they heard me when I hurt, hit the ground. I'm talking about Joseph and David. They come running, looking for me. I'm laying flat on the ground. And all I'm thinking about is I've never shot one yet. <laughs> but that's always the first time. Joints, company, connections, relationships, a company, a, a, a joint, a group of companions. Amen. Someone who matches another, have certain things in common. Connections where two things are fastened together. So within connections, listen to me, there are relationships. Whenever I have a connection with somebody, and I've used this a lot, there are attachments in life and there are connections in life. And when you've got a connection in life, you've got a relationship. You've got somebody that flows into your life and you're able to flow into theirs. Amen. Complementary relationships, amen, between two people in which each person's lifestyle fills in or supplies much of what is lacking or seems to be lacking in the other's lifestyle. In other words, when you come to church, you begin to connect with people. Those connections, those relationships are the joint that supplies here in this house. This to me should be the church. The church should be where relationships are supplying. Yesterday, I saw a camp meeting. Out at the ranch, I saw men show up. I saw people in the kitchen supplying. I saw people in the ropes course supplying. They were looking after one another. You can't do what we do without having a good joint. You got to have somebody that joins together and likes one another and enjoys being with one another in order to do all the things that this church is able to do. There's a principle of joining. Amen. In the beginning, God, when he created Adam, he realized Adam was lonely. He, he needed help. He named all the animals. And then he wanted to supply to him a joint. 
and he connected from his bone. He pulled a rib out of him, amen, a prime rib. Can I get an amen? And connected him to a wool man. When he done that, that was the beginning. And he said, for this reason shall a man leave. And Jesus quotes it in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him. They tempted Jesus. They said unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and he said unto them, have you not read? Do you not understand the scriptures that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? What did God make them? Amen. Hear it again. I have, one, I have one truth. It's biblical truth. Amen. If you're born male, you're male. If you're born female, you're female. Quit acting like somehow you didn't have a choice. Amen. That's the foolishness. So this is the only truth I know. As truth is changing all over, as science is changing all over, I stand on this absolute truth. So he said, I created them, male and female. And then he goes on to say, uh, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Therefore they are no more uh, two, but now one. What therefore God hath, come on, say it. Join together. Don't let a man put asunder. Join to yoke together, to couple, to team up, to find somebody that you can team up with. When you separate what God has joined, there's always going to be damage in both parties. So here's a joining together. The power of joining is found with Jacob and Leah. You remember Jacob? Jacob worked seven, was seven years for woo, hubba hubba, Rachel. Amen. That's Rachel, right? Am I getting the right one here? Man, he was so excited about getting Rachel. When you can work for a father-in-law for seven years to get a woman you in love. He said them seven years went by like seven days. But what he didn't realize was Rachel had an older sister by the name of Leah. And their culture said that the oldest had got to get married first. So Jacob slipped off until a, got, got into a honeymoon situation with lights off. Mm -hmm. He woke up the next morning with Leah, and he thought, dear God, this man has deceived me. Can I tell you about Jacob? Jacob was a deceiver. His whole life was deception. He was always deceiving. Amen. Uh, the Scripture uses a word worm for him. He was a And if you're a deceiver, you're going to find somebody else going to deceive you. Amen. And that's what Laban did to him. So he ended up with Leah. Amen. Now, the problem with Leah, and I, I want to thank God for Leah because she did everything she could to help him understand that I love you too, Jacob. Now, later, of course, he got with Rachel. But Leah said this in Genesis 29, 34, because children were so important, amen, to the lineage. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my, will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons therefore his name will be called Levi the word Levi is where we get the the uh, the Levites when you study the tribes of Israel the Levites were the worshipers they're the ones that led the worship uh, um, Moses and and his brother is Aaron was a Levite Aaron was a Levite, so Levites were important. The word Levite means to join, to be attached, to, to connect together. The sons of Levite, the Levites, Aaron, of course, the lineage, they were worshipers. Listen to me. Where there is worship, there's going to be joining. Where you worship, you will join. That's why it's so important when you're in this house and you hear the worship go, join in. Amen. Join Because now you become a couplet between heaven and earth. Do you know what God wants to supply into your life from heaven? You won't know until you connect to it. Amen. A lot of us are leaking out. We just sit here like knots on the log. Amen. And nothing's happening. And we wonder why nothing's happening. Sometimes you need to get your hands up. Well, I'm not Pentecostal. I didn't ask you if you were. I just ask you, you want to do the Bible. The Bible says lift your hands and worship. Amen. And praise the Lord. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto the Lord, all ye people. The Bible teaches us to dance before the Lord. So when I couple with heaven, amen, I start worshiping. When I start worshiping, I start joining. Where there is joining, there is worship. This Asbury revival, as Pastor David mentioned, has already sprung over into Tennessee. It sprung over into South Alabama at Samford University. Amen. Students are gathering and doing things. What are they doing? They're joining with heaven and in joining they needed a joint can i get an amen and you know every college i know god know all about joints 
And here they got a real joint because all of a sudden their worship began to join them and couple them with heaven. Amen. And heaven's pouring in. There's no great preachers. There's no great worship band. Amen. There are, let me say pronounced people like that. It's just a natural outflow of three things. Amen. Prayer, repentance, and worship. And during prayer, repentance, and worship, I got friends that are traveling hundreds of miles. Some of them are flying in and going in. They just want to be and feel the experience of sitting in a meeting with nothing else to go. Two, three hours go by, and all they're doing is worshiping God. It's going into 2 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. And they're still where it started February the 8th on my birthday. I ain't saying it's me, but amen. I ain't saying. So it started on that day, and it's continued on. It's going to keep continuing, and one day it, it'll be over. But when it's over, it's going, to hold, it's going to hold things into their life. It's going to remind them of the joining they had together. The fellowship they met and they connected with. Worship does that. It brings us together like that. Amen. Where there is joining, there's always going to be work that's going to get done. When you join, you can't do anything without people joining and connecting. Amen. In Nehemiah 4, 6, when Nehemiah built the wall, he said, and all the people will join together until the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. We couldn't have done this building without people joining together. We couldn't have built what we built in New Caney without people joining together. It takes a joint. Can I get an amen? Amen. Every now and then, you just need a good joint. I'm not talking about a gummy. You need a joint. People who refuse to join never help in the progress of a vision. Some never join in worship. Some never join in work. Some never join. They'll show up, but they're not joining. They're not part of it. So when you show up and you start connecting, Amen. And you couple them together, it changes. When, when we're joined to the wrong things, the Scripture tells us that Ephraim was joined himself to idols. Leave him alone. People that join the idols, stay away from them. Idolatry, anything that takes the place of Jesus, stay away from it. We talked about the prodigal son. The Bible says of him that he joined to the wrong people. Verse 14 of chapter 15 of Luke says that when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to the citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. When you join yourself to the wrong people, you're going to find yourself a, 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 in a filthy farmyard feeding the swine. That's no way for a Jewish boy to be. But he joined himself to the wrong people. You know, I can tell you who you are if you tell me who you joined to. Amen. Who you're connecting yourself with. The prodigal son. Actually, the word prodigal means out of joint. He's out of joint. He, he's disjointed. He's out of place, dislocated. And when the head of a bone slips from his socket, hence not working well together. Amen. He's, he's uh, disoriented. Amen. Does something happen to him? So he's out of joint. Whenever you backslide, whenever you slide back, amen, you disjoint yourself from the body. It's good when you get joined. You know what, what we use? We've learned this over the years. We use this uh, blue uh, glue. We'll wrap it around that PVC pipe. Amen. And we shove that thing on there and we get it real good and it, and it, it just heats up. Amen. When you, when you get around people like that, they, they fire you up. Hallelujah. You get a little fire in you and it heats you up and it's set there. And then when you turn that water on, it's, it's joined. It's as tight there as anywhere else on that pipe because that's where it's joined together. Sometimes God puts us in places where it's the heat of life. Amen. The, the tough times in life that joined us together. I want to tell you through the hurricanes, the floods, it joined this house together. Amen. Two years ago, last week, fro uh, uh, ice storm came into this area. It joined people together. You know what you found out? That some of your pipes weren't joined. Is that right, Sister Dolly? Some of them were not joined. Amen. They cracked under the pressure. Hallelujah. Pressure break a pipe. Hallelujah. So it's good to understand that when you're under the pressure, you're able to handle it. We need churches that way. Let me start closing here. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel walks up on a place, and there's nothing but dry bones. Them bones were dry bones. It just laid out, just bones everywhere. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 37, 7, God spoke to him. He said, prophesy over them. Speak a word from God. Amen. Tell them. So I was commanded to prophesy. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. It's one of them crazy miracles that took place. He prophesied. Hey, 
Life come back into these bones. Life come back. And all of a sudden, the bones started rattling. Can you imagine being there? The bones started rattling. And then this bone, now here's the issue, church. You can't make the tibia join to the elbow. Amen. You do, you're going to walk real funny. Amen. You, you, the, your foot going to be up here where it shouldn't be. So the bones have got to be connected in the right places. So when he started prophesying for the bones to come back together, prophecy, words spoken. Sometimes you've got to say it. I say it. God, heal my eyes. I say, God, heal my legs. Heal my joints. God, heal this church. Amen. Touch that baby and take the seizures away from that child. And then you got to speak the word. Amen. You got to prophesy. You got to say something. Amen. About your future. Just hate to sit back and think about it. Say, if you got the ability to say it, say it. Amen. So he prophesied, and it produced a noise. Something was happening. The prophecy brought the thing back together. The prophecy brought bone to bone. It represented structure and order. Sometimes, for sometimes, for something God has been speaking about divine order in this house, there has to be order here. So God speaks, and all of a sudden the bones are together. But there's still a problem. There was no life. All you had was bones coming back together, but there was no life. There's no life there. So God speaks in verse 8 to him. He said, And when I beheld, lo, the sinew and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them about, but there was no breath in them. There was no breath. I, I watched this miracle. It was like corpses coming back together. I saw the sinew and the flesh. I saw the skin wrapped back around in the eyeballs. I saw hair come back on. It was like I saw dead people lying everywhere, but their, and their bodies were complete. And then verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood upon their feet, a vast army. There is nothing that can replace the breath of God. When he created Adam out of the dust of the earth, he was a body laying there, and then he breathed in the hill. The Bible says that these people stood in the day of Pentecost for days, I think they started with, I don't know, 320 folk. They were down to like 50. And not a lot of folk can tarry, but they tarried. And the breath of God whoo, blew into the place. And revival started. And cloven tongues were on the heads of the people there. And they began to speak in other tongues. And they preached the word out in the street. And 3,000 got saved. And 5,000 got saved. Miracles started happening. There are times I think we miss it. We, we say, God, okay, we're together, but what we need is the breath of God in us. We need your breath. We, we need to, when, when a young man laid on a football field among 80,000 uh, football fans and the game stopped, the Buffalo Bills were kneeling down and the Cincinnati Bengals were kneeling down and a young man knelt over him and he began to push his chest and breathe life back into him. It takes the breath of God to change something. And the Bible says he began to breathe. He said, God, breathe into this. And he called it an army. When I read the word army, I think of order. Amen. How God brings order back into a place. And there's a lot of coming together. But in the gathering, there's no life. There has to be life. I thank God for the crowd. I told my pastor this morning, I want to be blatantly honest with you. I've been troubled by my eyesight. I'm troubled how blurry you are to me right now. I can't tell the time. I can't read the back. It's happened within one year. And I told pastor, I said, I think to myself, and, and I know this is a negative thing for many of you to hear from me, but I thought, Lord, what if I go blind? What if I lose my total sight? And if I do, I'm, I still be able to preach because I know enough for the word and I have an ability and a gifting for it. But then I wouldn't be able to see your expressions. I wouldn't be able to see how you are interacting with me. And if that happened, how could I, how would I handle that? And, and a joy came over me, and I do not believe that I will go blind. And Mike, I pray for you, sir, because I know that you struggle also in this. But I do not know, believe I'll go blind. But the bottom line, if I did, then it wouldn't matter to me what your expression was. My calling would just be to preach the Word and let you receive it. And when Ezekiel looked out over those bodies... It was a miracle seeing the bones come together, the joints, and then the sinew that supplies. He saw all that happening, but there was no life. And I pray to God today, 
that God would breathe into this house. And whether I see you respond is not up to me, but that God would breathe a vision into you for a future, that God would breathe hope into you for your children and your grandkids, that God would breathe into you the ability to join husband and wife, that God would breathe into you healing into your body, that you would start to sense the breath of God into your life. We need the breath of God. It's, it's got to be a cry in our life. God, breathe into our teenagers. Breathe into the Crosby School District. Breathe into Dayton, God. Breathe into Channel View. God, breathe into this area in Baytown and Huffman. God, breathe into the four corners. As a matter of fact, that was a part of the prophecy. Amen. As they begin to pray and breathe, the Scripture says in verse 9, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. What about prayers? Is that God sent them in from the north, the south, and the east, and the west? Bring them in from all four corners. Bring these joints together, amen, that they may supply strength and they can stand again. Help our church to stand during depression, oppression. God, let nobody that we love be possessed. God, order to be restored. Let complementary relationships come into this house. Let people walk in and feel like this is where I belong. These are my brothers and my sisters. I feel joined to them. Amen. I'll supply need to them and, ba and vice versa. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God, let relationships be strengthened in this house. Let people begin to supply for one another. I thank you, God, for those who feed the hungry in here and clothe. The naked, those who understand there are people that have been incarcerated that need to be visited. God, put a fire in the heart of the evangelist to reach people for you. It's not about a show and tell in the pulpit. Breathe again. Breathe again. As you're doing in Asbury and other places, breathe again. Let there be revivals in our homes, on the workplace, in our schools. Breathe again, God. We need to be joined. We need to supply. We need to speak the same thing. Breathe. Breathe. Come on, Jesus. Breathe into our lives. Breathe into our homes. Individually, breathe into us. You brought our bones back together. You strengthened us with muscle. Breathe. I speak against every addiction in this house to break in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, the name of Jesus brings healing in this house. There will be healing. We will see miracles. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last week I